Agbo Ato, uh, long life, a cowboy, welcome. Adupoi uh, Ori Egun, we thank the ancestors for the, their wisdom. Today I want to do a uh, kind of a deep dive into Ifa cosmology. And I want to preface it with a couple of thoughts so it just doesn't sound like a uh, egghead esoteric exercise and information we'll never need. It's my belief that the cosmology is taught uh, in the liturgical language of Yoruba culture um, is reflected in the rituals we do. It's certainly reflected absolutely in the beginning opening prayer for uh, divination with the Ikin. Everything in that prayer is a gesture referring to the first moment of creation. And I think if we don't understand that and don't appreciate, we rob ourselves of the ability to infuse our consciousness into the ritual and subsequently participate in co-creation. I think without understanding what we're doing during the ritual process of divination and other things, but let's just start there for today, the ritual process of divination, we don't understand what the gestures and the words are alluding to then, in my opinion, we're probably just doing empty drama, if that makes sense. And, uh, uh, you know, empty drama is okay, but it's not effective as a tool for what I would call alchemical transformation. Anybody not understand what I said? Are we all on the same page with that? So, Here's the point I want to make about cosmology. Cosmology is the study of the origins of creation. Um, in the Western world, cosmology includes uh, the So a really significant factor, in my opinion, is the fact that my read of the liturgical Yoruba words that relate to uh, can everybody hear me? I got a notice saying they can't. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, no, we, can hear you now. we can hear you now, but it did cut out a little bit. All right. If it does again, uh, somebody uh, text me or something. Uh, I, I'm, I've reconfigured my computer and I have a few tech problems, but we'll work through it. All right. So cosmology, as I understand it, based on my translation of liturgical Yoruba words, is virtually identical to quantum physics. All right. Quantum physics, for those uh, who may not be up to speed on that whole part of reality, quantum physics was developed uh, about 200 years ago now. It wasn't fully uh, formed until about 50 years ago. So it's a recent uh, addition to the Western scientific paradigm. So the point is the cosmology traditionally in the Western world was based on astrophysics and particle physics. Both those forms of physics are based on Newtonian physics and Einstein theoretical physics. So that's all a lot of words to say that the model for science for cosmology has traditionally been cause and effect. It's been a mechanistic model. In other words, if you could understand the cause, you could predict the effect. That's the whole best basis for Western science, more or less. Uh, the problem is particle physics explains the interaction of atoms with each other fairly well, but it does not explain at all the formation of uh, atoms. So the science of the formation of atoms started when a man named uh, Heinrich uh, Hertz 
notice that if you flash a beam of light on a particular different kinds of metal, that the reflection from that metal will occur in different frequencies. All right, so that mm, may not seem significant, but what it's saying is light, when it interacts from with itself from different sources, has the ability to alter frequencies and frequencies shape reality. So it was a huge discovery. It was really challenging for physicists at the time. It's challenging to this day. Oh, somebody want to comment on it? Sandy, mute, please. Uh, um, so the point is, is that a, a man named David Bohm looked at that. Oh, excuse me. First, the first significant contribution to quantum physics is when uh, Planck used the uh, data collected by uh, Hertz to make a formula defining the maximum size, and I think the only size, but it's certainly the size of an atom. There's a formula of the size of an atom, which is a indication of the relationship between the neutron or the center of the atom to the uh, electron, which is the surface of the atom. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, formula that he created is called Planck's constant. It's a very complicated mathematical formula. I don't remember it. It wouldn't mean much to anybody. But the point is that exact same mathematical formula was located in stone in Egypt in the Nubian desert 9,000 years ago. So Western science has understood the size and structure of an atom for, uh, I would say, 120 years. Africans have understood it for at least 9,000, I would argue, even longer. Uh, certainly in Ifa, they've understood it for 10,000 years. It's called the Planck's constant. The place where it's located is in the middle of the Nubian district, which nowadays is the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was barely noticed until 1970. There's a star map above ground. It's kind of like Stonehenge. And they did uh, uh, excavation, not digging it up, but with uh, radar and discovered two other layers. One layer was a picture of uh, Earth as you approach Earth from outer space. And the last layer was a, a stone representation of con uh, Planck's constant. All right. So Planck's constant served as the foundation for David Bohm realizing that the atomic structure had a number of subatomic elements. Is that clear? In other words, you know, we've all seen the picture of the atom of like looks like the solar system with the sun in the middle and planets spinning around all right so that's a cute drawing but it's got nothing to do with reality what what atoms do based on Bohm's research is they circulate energy in, at different frequencies all right and so what he was able to prove through experimentation was that uh those frequencies interact in a non-mechanistic way. All right, so it's important, I think, to grasp that uh, fundamental idea. In the mechanistic model of atoms, it's like when you play pool, you hit the pool ball in a certain place and it hits the next ball in another place, that ball is going to go in a certain direction. I mean, it's 100% automatic. You can photograph it, you can uh, quantify it, you can do all kinds of things, but it's always the same. In other words, if you hit one ball straight on another one, the ball will move straight. If you hit it to the left, it'll move to the right. I mean, that's just what the way mechanics works in the universe as we see it. But Bohm discovered that subatomic particles bump into each other and respond in a curve of probability 
that means there's a range of responses to the exact same interaction. Can you picture that? In other words, if you, if you can imagine two particles colliding in the mechanistic view, it's automatic. But in according to Bohm, there's a range of probability, which means the reaction can be anywhere along a curve. It can be like this or that or that or that or this or that or that or that. So the implication of that non-specific, non-mechanistic reaction that occurs through interaction is that the subatomic particles have the ability to make a choice. The ability to make a choice is the classical definition of consciousness. So everything in creation from the smallest subatomic particle to the stars themselves embrace the ability to make decisions. Now that's a non-Western scientific point of view, but it's certainly consistent with uh, EFA cosmology and I would argue most, if not all, pre-Christian Earth-centered cosmologies that I've ever read. And I would also argue that the reason it's so accurate is because the ancients had an astute ability to engage in altered states of consciousness that brought them that information in the same way, no matter what the cultural context was. You know. Sure, Sarah, uh, yeah, if Jollibee wants to add something to what I said. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, let me just mute that you do that. Uh, what I want to add is, um, I'll see, we got that reverb. Oh, wait, wait, I, I can fix it. Now speak. Okay, yeah. Um, what I want to add is that linear thinking is how Planck's theory was based. It was based on linear thinking, which means that uh, it's an, uh, a me mechanistic, mechanistic reactions are cause and effect only. And they don't, and so there, there has to be a collision in that for an effect to occur. In um, abstract thinking, which is uh, the thinking of Ifa, um, it isn't an issue of um, a collision, it's an issue of co-creation, of working together. So there's no co uh, a collision. And in fact, the reason that the ancestors could work with this is because they communicated with those forces without collision. That means they interacted with them. And so, so that interaction became the mechanism for creating another thing. And this is where Western science has, uh, has been um, uh, fallen short because they keep thinking that in linear thinking, if you have cause and effect, that's the only thing. And that isn't the only thing in in the, in the in Ifa's cosmology. Okay, Baba. Yeah, Can you hear me? I don't think you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now without the reverb? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So the reason for that difference that uh, uh, yeah, just shared with us, when you're living in a cause and effect universe, the natural inclination is to want to control things which is very different than working with things, which is why your cosmology is at the core of how you see yourself in the world you live in. And that vision of how you see yourself in the world you live in affects how you relate to the world and people around you. Those who see a cause and effect world want to control everything. They want to control your thoughts. They be, believe in things like censorship, uh, mind control and uh, economic uh, exploitation and let's not go into all that but the point is there's a consequence for how you see evolution it's not just an abstract theory okay so to, to, to make my point so when Bohm came up with his ideas at that time Einstein had been spending decades looking for a mechanistic uh, 
uh, explanation to explain the uh, formation of atoms. He, he, he never found it because it doesn't exist. He died wondering why that wouldn't work. So the uh, when Bohm came up with his explanation, that was a severe challenge to Western academic forms of science. So uh, Oppenheimer, who was one of the leading physicists in the world, Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer and uh, Einstein called a conference and they called the leading physicists from all the, around the world saying, how can we challenge the experiments, not the ideas, the experiments of David Bohm that showed that his theories were correct. And the response from the group was we can't. And then Oppenheimer said, okay, then the only thing we can do is ignore it, pretend he didn't say it and not give him any credibility. Within three months after that, thanks to uh, Oppenheimer's efforts, uh, the FBI uh, accused Baum of treason and he migrated to Brazil. So, um, you know, the whole point is the suppression of that scientific truth continues to this day and it had its origins as the ideas came into uh, fruition, let's say, all right. So to me, that's a significant point. Uh, 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 so, so to be clear, the integration of physics, particle physics, astrophysics, particle physics, and quantum physics can only occur if you believe in a conscious universe. The idea of a conscious universe is the foundation for alchemy, which I'll speak about in a future session. I'm gonna to stick today with the idea of uh, cosmology, all right? So Bohm says, and I say, and Ifa says, that before the world came into being, there was a huge mass of plasma. Plasma is a word that's not emphasized in school much anymore, but plasma is neither solid nor liquid, it's in between. In the early days of quantum physics, the person who coined the word, uh, coined the word ether to describe plasma was James uh, Clerk Maxwell, who was also the man who was able to identify the different frequencies of light. So, Modern science doesn't uh, acknowledge ether, but the problem with that is that means that 99% of the universe is invisible, unexplained, and has no theoretical uh, description. You know, the world of mecha mechanical physics, which functions and has a place in creation, is like 0.0005% of all of creation. It's fairly significant. No. So if we don't put science in the context of conscious components to creation, then we're, we're living in a fake fantasy made up universe uh, in which finding our role and our place and our function is all but impossible. So I want to explain, start to explain the alternative to the mechanistic worldview of science with the, what I call the conscious view of science by analyzing uh, your words that describe it, okay? So for me, if we're using certain words, we don't understand them, then what are we doing? You know, it's like me trying to explain how to fix the carburetor in German. You know, I don't speak German, so that would be kind of a waste of time. So the point being is, in order to effectively do oriki or invocations, it kind of helps to know what we're saying. It kind of helps, look at Omilade is laughing at me now. It kind of helps to know what we're saying and the meaning of the word and I, ultimately the significance of the words. So before there was creation, uh, before there was, there was something, at a time when there was nothing, and by nothing, I mean no thing. We really can't say anything about anything prior to the first moment of creation because there's no conceptualization of it. We have no context for describing a universe in which there's no time and space. That's just an abstract idea at best, all right. But the existence of that 
Tibetan reality is described in liturgical Yorba by the word do. You see that? Do. Do has a number of meanings. Mm. It means darkness. It means uh, empty. It means um, it means it's the root word of the word black. So it has that connotation, but it doesn't really mean black. If that makes sense, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, um, Forgive me, I, I, I want to look up the definition of do, make sure I got it complete here. So yes, do, okay, it also means to strive and to unfold. All right. So unfolding is a synonym for creation, right? So we can look at do as the source of uh, manifestation in the universe, right? The word do. Uh, forgive me for a minute, I need to. Reconfigure my computer, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Let me add something. Please, oh. yeah. Do is the collective, uh, I would say is the, um, the, the area where you create. So everything that comes is from do, including light. Light came from darkness. So all it is a collective um, platform for which creation comes forth. Well spoken. So the word do becomes a fundamental concept in the, the Ifa cosmology, all right? So do has no structure or form and I would argue it has no consciousness either. So essentially from a quantum physics point of view, using the language of Western science rather than the language of Ifa, do is subatomic particles without structure. It's like a big soup of protons, uh, neutrons, uh, quarks, and electrons, Mozart. all of that. And so what was Mozart's, what was the other thing? So, Bosons, that's right, bosons. So that soup is undifferentiated and unformed and waiting for the infusion of structure, we could say, right? And so uh, in, in quantum physics, that do is called ether. Ether existed before time. And the important point to remember is it still exists. The vast space of uh, the universe that we can see includes huge elements of ether or do or unformed particles, unformed consciousness, all right? So looking now at the etymology of the words do is the suffix of the word odu, which is the spirit of do. Odu means the spirit to strive to strive, unfold, generate, create, give birth, right? Odu meaning portal. It also means pot in Yorba. You know, words have multiple meanings depending on con context. So Odu is the Yorba word for womb in the physical sense of mother giving birth to a child. But it also means uh, womb in the sense of those interdimensional portals that give birth to solar systems, to galaxies, to atoms. Odu is a universal concept that describes the emergence of energy patterns from nothingness into something. The existence of, the, of Odu is the reason why there is something instead of nothing. From a cosmological point of view, that's the first question of science. Why is there something instead of nothing? I mean, ultimately, we don't know the answer to that, I would argue, but we do understand how that process unfolds, all right? So if we look now at the next word that's important in terms of this context, by the way, all these words are posted on the Egg Bay page. Uh, if uh, you lose track, you can go back and review. I call them the cliff notes. Oh, do, do. 
You know, the word O is spirit. Dudu is the source of darkness. O Dudu would be Odu in its primal form, the very first manifestation of the feminine principle of Odu as the cauldron that gives birth to the rest of creation. Let me, you know, I was going to wait till the end, but I get nervous that I'm not making as much sense as I'd like to. Any questions on that so far? We all more or less uh, on the same page. All right. So, Odu then becomes a primal concept. Odu do becomes the primal concept of Odu. And then we have the word that's common in, in our scripture and used commonly, but rarely translated correctly. Odu do wa. We all heard that term. Odu do wa from the allegiance Odu do. Iwa. In Yorba, the word wa, W A, means come, you know, uh, wamio, come to me, right? But Iwa means come from heaven to earth, come from the invisible realm to the visible realm. Odudu wa is a reference to the first manifestation of anything out of the darkness of Dudu. It's the primal seed of creation. It's the primal spark, let's say, of manifestation, maybe would be a better way to describe it. But Oduduwa is process more than spirit, if that makes sense. You know, so it, we, we're nature worshipers, so it's incumbent on us to know what force in nature we're referring to when we're using words related to spirit. Otherwise, we're just talking gibberish. So Oduduwa is the primal progenitor of all of creation. But all Yorba words have multiple meanings. So if you know your uh, Yorba history, Odudu was also identified as the first Yorba king. Oduduwa, you remember that in Yorba history? Everybody thinks, okay, Oduduwa, it's got to be a dude. Well, we know from uh, Oba, Fashade, that kings don't have to be men, and a king with the name of the spirit of the womb comes is not likely a guy. You understand? So when the Yorba speak of the uh, progenitor of the Yorba people being Oduduwa, I seriously doubt if it was a man. The confusion, I think, is a patriarchal <laughs> spin on the fact that the Yorba language has no personal pronouns. There's no way in your order to say Odu do wa he. Uh, you can say Odu do wa the man or Odu do wa the woman, but you can't say Odu do wa he or Odu do wa she. That doesn't. Um, Richard, do you want to add something to that, please? Yeah, can, can I just um, make just, just one small um, observation and one small comment? Sure. If, it, if it's a, if you got a better understanding of the language than me, so please don't hesitate. Go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, Odu Duwa and, and Odu, uh, the prefix to as as referencing the source or the ether or right. something that came before creation. Right. In Central Africa, uh, the Congo region, the Bantu people, they have a word called Ngenge, which is N-G-E-N-G-E. -E -N -G -E, right. Which means... It's a similar concept as right. they do or, or, or the do do and in Genge in the Bantu central language of the Congo, uh, where the you know ancient kingdom of the Congo, you know the Mongol tribe or the Luba tribe, the Lunda tribe, uh, the the um, the Nganga, which were equivalent to like the um, Ifa priests, would utilize that notion of Genge to cause manifestations, you know, things to happen, um, so-called, what they call in the West, paranormal activities, you know, right. controlling weather, animals, uh, changing various minerals, you know, uh, telepathy, levitation, things as, as that nature. So I just wanted to add that in there. Yeah. Listen, I, I would, if I may be so bold, I'd like to make an analogy between that and your concept of gay and God. Ngege, Ngaga, gay. Uh, there's a there's a correlation there. It's direct. It's absolutely yeah. you put it together. Gay in Yorba means uh, uh, 
the uh, projection of female power, which would be gravity in this case, and yes. ga means the internalization of female power. So gay, ga creates gay, gay creates ga. It's a polarity within feminine, uh, I would call contractive energy that's at the foundation yes. of what I'm trying to explain here. So the, the no, similarity no. is spot on. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the word in Genga in Congolese culture actually means uh, it's similar to the ancient um, Asian symbol. You know, the yin and yang sure, female? absolutely, yes. In Bantu culture, in Genge, encompasses both. There is no male or female. It's, it's two parts of the same whole, if, you, if that makes sense. We have the same polarity, which I'm going to get to in a minute to lead up. We have the same polarity with Ashe and Ire. Ashe is the male expansive energy. Ire is the contracted energy. Yes. And they come into the world on, in a single beam of light, uh, according to Ifa. Uh, cosmology, uh, but I'm not quite there yet. Are we good? I, I really appreciate that. No, no problem. Thank you. I just want to um, thank you. Anytime, you just to please. That in there. <laughs> yes, listen, that's a valuable contribution, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I've also lost my place. So where are we? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, do do what? That was the last thing I said. Oh, do do what? Yeah. Okay. So okay. So here's where here's where the mind boggling part comes. Uh, if you if you uh, really soon here now you're going to have to put uh, duct tape around your head so when your brain explodes you will have all the pieces in one place. All right, so just wrap it there tight. Uh, bungee cord yourself to your chair. So the 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 uh, the doo doo, the darkness, the mystery, for reasons that I, quantum physics and Ifa doesn't explain, morphs into water just before the creation of time. And, excuse me, morphs into, yeah, uh, it goes from plasma to water, uh, which is called Omeo Rune or Omeo Locum in uh, Yorba. And those are references to cosmic water, not the water you drink here on planet Earth. All right. So Omeo mm, plasma starts to organize itself in the form of a hydrogen atom, all right? Hydrogen atom is one electron, one uh, neutron, yes. And uh, it's the simplest structure there is, all right? When the atoms of do begin to form an atom in Yorba, pay attention here, atom in Yorba is ota, which is the word we also use for stone. So the ota or the stones in our pots is a symbolic reference to the idea of atomic structure in creation. It's also a, 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 a symbolic reference to the idea that atoms or ota are the primal source of consciousness. Yes. Yeah, please, yeah. One of the things that uh, Western science, I don't think understands is that hydrogen is inclusive of all um, of the other uh, elements. It's inclusive, not exclusive. It's not, actually not a singular atom. It is all the collective atoms and that's why when the atoms break in upon itself, when it falls in upon itself and starts breaking up, you get the sub elements, the noble gases, and then you go on to the elements, uh, the 256 or the uh, pieces of hydrogen, which is the original element that has all of the, uh, it's actually inclusive and not a single element. I'm sorry, Papa, I'm, I'm just, uh, from, from a, a cosmological point of view, it is actually inclusive of everything. And when it breaks into it pieces, we get the other elements, uh, argon, uh, silver, um, uh, iridium, all of the other elements come from the original hydrogen uh, atom, which is inclusive. So what? What Sarah just did is gave you the secret of alchemy, which is about three lectures down the road. So that, <laughs> that's fine. What she just explained is Dr. Oyibo's uh, unified field theory, which is based on the I, alchemical idea that 
there's only one atom that's a hydrogen and that all the elements are a transformation of the uh, hydrogen atom, which uh, yeah, just explained with great eloquence. So that is the basis of alchemy, which takes a little more preparation to fully understand perhaps. So let's stick with the idea that the hydrogen atom somehow forms in uh, Dudu or Orun prior to the actual first manifestation of the, uh, what Western science calls the Big Bang, okay? So before we go into the Big Bang, which then transforms the darkness of Dudu into the physical reality that we see, be clear, in Western science, they say the Big Bang only happened once. In uh, Ifa cosmology, the Big Bang happens all the time everywhere. And when the Big Bang occurs, it creates like a mini universe next to the next universe that's created, next to the next universe that's created. And if you really understand the cosmological implications of uh, Odu, each of those universes can be uh, instigated based on different principles and different laws of physics, which we'll, again, we'll get in down the road. So here's the thing that I want to impress on everybody. The quanta, quanta means packet of information. That's what quanta means. It's a, like a little unit of information. Quanta in Yorba, the word for quanta in Yorba is ikin. Now we know the ikin is a seed from the fig tree, but we also know symbolic liturgical Yorba has multiple meanings. So if we look at the Elysian ikin from the uh, word Letter, I'm going to spell it I, new word K I N. That means literally I praise or I invoke, and then N is a placeholder in the Arabic language. So the word Ikin means I invoke. It's a reference to every level of invocation from the creation of the first uh, Adam to the biggest star. So the word Ikin, in terms of the cycle of life, death, transformation, rebirth, Ikin, the seeds we use for divination is symbolic of all the seeds of creation that manifest throughout evolution. You understand? So that so look at the ritual process. When we when we first invoke the ikin, the ikin are covered with a lid and we put our hand over. And we say, iba uruno si. So what we're saying is we're reaching for all the mysteries of creation, which remain hidden in the bowl and out of our sight, right? And then we knock on the bowl and ask for permission to see the mysteries. And the mysteries first become manifest in their primal form as seeds, all right? So in terms of Ifa creation myth, when all the hydrogen atoms, which are created at the same time, collapse together, they collapse in on themselves, creating what's called a black hole. And that black hole, the word for black hole in Yorba is o yigi o yigi, meaning the first shaking. The, the black hole or the first shaking results when the, the force of gravity on, uh, on uh, the hydrogen atom causes an explosion of a nebula, which produces the oxygen atom. And the production of that atom is created by the infusion of Allah into the doo-doo. In English, that would be light into the darkness. The word Allah is a reference to what James Clerk Maxwell called a longitudinal light beam. A longitudinal light beam is a straight line with no frequency. Clark taught, and his uh, research was uh, modified so it couldn't be comprehended and used. Uh, that's another story. But Clark, if you go back to his original uh, mathematical formula, showed how a longitudinal light beam is the source of free energy in all of creation. That's pretty significant. But he also showed that Allah carries the whole ground for the unfolding for the structure of all of creation. So what is the Yorba word for a hologram? <laughs> Anybody know? Awoshe, 
The power of mystery. It's also known as Afo Woshe, meaning the word uh, of power for the mystery, for unlocking the mysteries. All right. So understand this. So when we, we, we have the Ikan in our hand, that represents unformed creation. That is the uh, uh, plasma in do, or the plasma of do-do, right? That's in our hand, unformed creation. And then we ignite the holographic pattern of structure into those Ikan by doing what? by invoking the spirit of Ela, meaning the light. The possession of the diviner by the spirit of the light opens the door to giving form to the unformed patterns that are latent within a handful of Ikan. That is what's known as co-creation, all right? So the ancient Egyptians taught us and the uh, uh, ancient Yorubas reaffirmed the fact that all of creation is organized around the idea of a Merkaba. A Merkaba is a torsion sphere. A torsion sphere is like a big donut with a hole in the top and a hole in the bottom. A torsion sphere that's supported uh, by a three-sided pyramid from the bottom up and another three-sided pyramid from the top down. The base of those pyramids occurs at 19 degrees longitude, I believe. And if you look at it on a two-dimensional level, it looks like the Seal of Solomon or the Star of David, both of which predate Jewish culture by a lot and can be found uh, uh, at the, at the Osirum, which is the place uh, where they were initiated into the mysteries of Osiris and the ancient uh, Egyptian kingdom. That, uh, we're getting a bleed there. Just mute, sir. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so the... Uh, okay. Uh, hello? Yeah, okay. So the... Uh, um, the only, the only symbolic image on that ancient temple structure is the Seal of Solomon or the Star of David or the double uh, uh, triangle. So, that, so if you have two three-sided triangles, there's four points of contact with the sphere. Each of those points of contact is a portal within a portal. That makes sense, a portal within a portal. So each of those points of contact with the torsion sphere is either opened or closed. If it's open, you mark one line on the tray. If it's closed, you mark two lines on the tray. The right side is the upper pyramid. The bottom side is the, the uh, uh, left side of the, uh, the markings, the quadrants for Odu. So the things we mark on the tray is a three-dimensional representation, excuse me, a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional energy pattern that structures all of creation through the infusion of a longitudinal beam of light that carries the paradigm and the hologram for all of creation into the physical world where it then uh, bifurcates and separates into the polarity between uh, Ashe and E-ray or frequency and gravity. Ashe is a long frequency. Gravity is uh, light frequency turning it in on itself. Those are two different phenomena within it coming from a single source. You understand? So what we're doing is in, in invoking the spirit of Ela, and hear me clearly, going into possession with the spirit of Ela, we're um, infusing the void with structure. We're co-creating reality, and we're using that dynamic to solve whatever problem is sitting in front of us, brought to us by the person who's need, uh, in need of guidance. So rather than knowing a lot of stuff, rather than being smart, rather than making up stuff, we're going to the source of uh, creation and saying, show us how it should be done. Because at, at the source of creation, there is no time and space. All history, present, past, and future has already occurred. 
and we can tap into that reservoir of information to deal with the present moment. That is what Ifa is teaching that. So look at the, let's look briefly at the, uh, at the uh, Oriki for invoking possession by Ela, right? What are we saying? Ela uh, Osin is the Yorba word for water along with Omi, right? So Ela, the light, it is the child of water or the child of Osin or the child of Dudu, the child of the unformed matter in uh, plasma. Ela Omosin, Ela child of the stone of creation the resulting from the collapse of all uh, hydrogen atoms into a black hole. Hello, that's the first two sentences of the Ariki. We're describing the process of creation in that. Ela omosin, ela omo oyigi otamio, otamio, which means uh, the source of the atomic uh, uh, structure that makes me who I am. Ela omosi, ela omoyigi, otami owadi, oyigi, awadi meaning uh, bring from heaven the stuff that needs to manifest through the stone of creation. Awadi, oyigi, kioku wa, help me understand uh, that which needs to come forth in manifestation, a kioku mo. Help me uh, so the key of key was help me have the information come in the second sense is have me understand the information. So we're literally invoking for a revelation through the spirit of light to give structure to the reality, which we think we can apply on the current problem. And then the response uh, from the uh, congregation, the, the person doing the call says, which means Ela possess me. Hello? Anybody who doesn't think Ifa uh, priest going to possession need to figure out what they're saying when they invoke the the uh, uh, oracle. Sorry, that was a little judgmental. But the uh, uh, Ela role, the response is show Kale, which means ascend from heaven. Ela ro show Kale. How clear does that have to be before it's uh, we understand what it is we're talking about? You understand? So do not indulge in the misconception that that makes you then infallible we can get the truth from source and have no idea what it means that's always an option so the people who claim they're infallible because they're all well yeah maybe but uh um where are we at? yeah okay so I know it's a lot to internalize. Let's go through and uh, get comments and questions. I, uh, we're going we're gonna to spend at least the next two months on this topic and let it unfold slowly so that it really becomes a part of your conceptualization of what you're doing. These are not arbitrary acts. They're also not rigid acts. There's no issue of doing it correctly. There's the only issue of doing it effectively. So effective means connecting with the spirit of a law so you can retrieve information outside of your life experience that will give you guidance for solving a particular problem that will allow you to co-create the world you live in and create a better way to get through the day. Which is different than me trying to control you by scaring you to death so you give me lots of money so I can pay my light bill. Those are two different views of the world. And I would argue they're not compatible. And I would argue the second uh, option is not consistent with the teachings of the prophet Arumia. Uh, Omi Lade, uh, you have a question or a comment? I do actually, Baba. You said, um, Ela Iro means Ela possess me? Ela Ro means Ela possess me. The word Ro means go into possession. So you can use that word after any spirit. Ocean roll, shango roll, ego roll, 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 meow. That's kind of a generic uh, uh, O 
Fauche used as part of the uh, process of uh, uh, going into possession, but it's really fundamental because if you use that word to understand what it means, it puts you into possession and you need to be in possession to put somebody else in possession when you're doing an initiation. Ashe. So it's a fundamental tool in your uh, Oriki uh, elevation, do initiations effectively toolkit. And you said shakale means what? Uh, 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 descend from heaven. Shokale, shoka. It literally means uh, come with power to the earth. So, uh, uh, yeah, shokale. Bring power to the earth is what it literally means, but it's the equivalent of uh, descend. Uh, okay, so uh, Jamar forgot to put the uh, duct tape on his head, so his, his brains are now oozing out onto the couch. And uh, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's back up, Jamar. Akeem, do you have a question? Akeem? Oh, you're good. Okay. Uh, 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 Shakur, hold on. Uh, listen, let me. I, I'd ask, uh, uh, who did I ask? Yeah, hold on. I uh, okay. I'm sorry. Listen, forgive me. I'm gonna take a deep breath and come back into my body. Jamar, do you have a question? No, you're good. You understood all that. Repeat it back to me <laughs> in, in, in three sentences or less. Uh, Shakur, jump right in there. Let's take a turn. That's okay. This is this is the we're gonna give a re an award from now on called the uh, Shakur. Tremel Best Questions in IFA Award. We're not going to give it to him. We're going to name it after him because he's already secured that position in the family. So, yes, you had a question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Baba. Um, uh, does IFA uh, explain how does the, uh, Allah or the light come out of um, Oyigi Yigi? No, and I don't think anything does. I don't think anybody knows. If you understood that, you would be God. Uh, so it's not likely that you'll ever perceive that. That's the that's the great reverence we have for the fact that there's something instead of nothing. If I could explain how Ela merged from Oyigi Yigi, I'd be a pretty smart dude. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Ifa supports the the Greek idea that hubris is a taboo, thinking you are God or you know everything God does. There's a transcendent right reality which we will never ever understand, and then there's a uh, what's the opposite of transcendent? The uh, normal reality we live in. The uh, and so to confuse the two is to commit the fundamental is to violate the fundamental taboo of all religions, thinking you're God, you know. So when a person tells you you must obey me, you just do it, I say you must do this above, you must give me money. If you don't do this or that, you're gonna die. I am the person who controls your whole life, believe, believe me, obey me, do everything I say. That is the ultimate sin. And we're suffering that uh, violation of taboo as a culture with people saying what we can and can't talk about. Are you freaking kidding me? I mean, who gave themselves that right? You know, the constitution that I read in law school says that we all have the God-given inalienable right to freedom of religion and freedom of choice. You understand? And because I always speak as a spiritual person, our spiritual student of spirituality, because I always speak from a religious perspective, every time I'm censored, it's a violation of the freedom of religion. But apparently that's okay. And the reason it's okay is nobody seems to be bothered by that. For me, I get a little annoyed. Uh, Makes sense? Uh, you must be a child of Shango to want to know the answer to that question. <laughs> Omilai, did I have another question? Yeah, Baba, sorry. Um, sure. So you were saying that the Akeem being in the left hand, are we to always hold it in the left hand? Oh, I didn't necessarily say that. No, that's a little too OCD. The fact that they're in your hands means you're embracing the mystery of unformed reality. That's what you're doing, right? And you're giving form to that by taking it out a piece at a time. You're extracting the subatomic particles from the structure of atoms. And you're saying this piece of the atomic structure is a open portal in the upper right-hand quadrant of the top pyramid. 
So it is those, you have 256 different combinations of how those portals can open and close. And the difference in the opening and closing creates a geometric pattern in the center of the Makaba, which then creates a specific resonance, which extends out into the world. And that resident then has an influence and impact on shaping your reality, all right? So in Western uh, musical theory, there are uh, 12 pitches between an octave, for those that know what that means, between middle C and upper C. But in Ifa, there are 256 pitches between uh, an octave, and then there's an unlimited number of octaves. So the variation in frequency is just unimaginable. Uh, if that makes sense, did that make sense? Did that answer your question? I think sort well, of. Let, let me know if I'm understanding it correctly. So the ikin is basically the atoms that create your reality. The ikin are the subatomic particles that come together to form structure that shapes reality. Okay. We use the ikin as the seeds of creation to form the structure of the macabre. Does that make sense? I know that's a lot of high flute words. Uh, Ifa Dara, do you have a question? Hello, did you hear me? Ifa Dara? I love you, Baba. I love you. We, yeah. When, when pounding Akeen, should you hear the seeds inside the Akeen? Should all your Akeens be completely solid when you shake them? I, I, I don't find that. Uh, Necessarily, uh, I don't know. I've, been, I've never noticed and it never is really effective. The, the key thing to do when you're pounding the Ekin is to make sure that you're accessing the spirit of Ela. The spirit of Ela has a specific resonance and a specific feeling tone which is the point of Tefa, initiation, so you can feel that. So when you do divination, you feel it again, you'll know you're in tune with the divination process. Uh, now, if somebody taught you that, I'm not going to say it's wrong. It could be effective. It could be. But for me, the... Uh, well, the reason... Uh, okay, so for me, after a while, you get to a point where you can connect to ala without having to do that. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a, a result of getting older, but uh, um, we want to resonate with a law and know what that feels like so that we are absolutely certain that we're taking our own ego out of the equation. Does that make sense? I hope I understood your question. Yes, thank you, Baba. Well, listen, uh, but, but don't let it drop there. Do you get value out of listening to the sheet shake? If you do, tell us about it. I didn't hear you. What did you say? If you get value from that process, share it with us. That's unfamiliar. Okay, I just was alarmed that my kings, I could hear the seeds, and I was making sure that they were. No, no, I, I, that's not a problem. Yeah, Sarah wants oh. to answer that, address that. Good job. Okay. Yeah. There are some cultures that um, uh, absolutely uh, want you to be able to hear the seed on the inside. And these are all representative representations of nature. So understand that it's not wrong that they do that. It's not wrong or right. It's that, that what they're doing is using a representation of the pole, the seed, uh, uh, even, uh, well, the seed, let me say, it, the seed that you're um, using in order to bring something forth because remember you know when you have the seed you got your nucleus on the inside so they're saying okay if you hear the the rattle you got the nucleus on the inside of your seed but um but this is a representation understand that if you understand nature you'll be able to work with what you have and 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 still bring forth our shape yeah, it's just that you need to understand that. And they're showing you that. That's why they're saying they're, they're giving you tools um, in, in other cultures. They'll give you these tools to use so that you can, that to help you get the representation in your mind so you can bring it forth. I shall. Thank you. Did that help? That was a good explanation. Thank you. Yeah. It was uh, a good one. Thank you. Yeah, it was very good. Yes. Uh, Hassan, did you have a question? Hassan, I don't know who that is. 
Did you disappear, Hassan? Oh, uh, uh, yes, uh, I will we'll wait for him to come back. Yaladay uh, Efontayo, did you have a question? Oh, here he is. He's still there. Uh, Hassan, did you hear me? All right. Uh, uh, Efuntayo, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, Shea Baba. Okay, nice. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, Mariama, did I call on you already? No. Well, I'm not hearing you. Can I ask another question while we're waiting? Yes, who's that? Ifa Dara. Yeah, go ahead. Out of the 21 Ikeens, how many Ikeens should have more than five eyes? There's no rule on it. Anybody who told you that doesn't know what they're talking about. Excuse okay, me. so you can have... take a serious look at the tradition. That <laughs> I'm sorry. I try not to be critical, and I'm doing my best. The, there's three eyes and there's four eyes or four eyes and more. The symbolic difference between three eyes and four eyes is the three-eyed Ikan create uh, 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 the uh, figs from the three-eyed Ikan create uh, palm oil. They're part of the staple diet of Yoruba culture. Four-eyed Ikan uh, come from figs that are poisonous. So when a farmer finds a tree that gives four-eyed ikan, they put a red cloth on it, and then the ikan that fall from that tree are um, um, gathered by the awos and used for divination. And some of those ikan have four, five, six, seven, eight uh, mutations on them on the seeds. And the, the uh, in traditional ifa, an awo receives 33 ikan, 16 are used uh, to keep on the shrine for meditation. Uh, 17 are used for divination with one representing Eshu Odara. The little face on the top of the tray is not Eshu Odara. It's Olu, meaning God or the creator or Ramfe. And you put the 17th Ikan on the face of Olu to represent the mouthpiece of Orun coming to earth. I, you know, I, you forgive my annoyance, but I see so many... It, there's so many taboos people are talking about that are restrictive that have no precedent in traditional Ifa. There's nothing restrictive in the taboos at all, ever. Sometimes the taboos relate to foods that are not restrictive. They're foods that are identified for use as medicine. That's different than saying don't ever eat a banana. There's also no taboos on what you can do and can't do. You can't initiate people. You can't have almost, you can't divine. I hear people come to me, those taboos all the time. And the question becomes, where's the precedent for that in the Odu I haven't seen it anywhere ever. And the reason that becomes important is because every year on New Year's, this time of the year, every village in traditional Yoruba culture recites the entire opus of Odu for the uh, edification, illumination, and instruction of the entire community, meaning there are no secrets. And those uh, recitations of Odus include a recitation of the taboos for each verse. And the taboos are more along the lines of admonitions to guide a person to their highest destiny, not to restrict them. There are no taboos based on somebody saying, I think you shouldn't go to the grocery store and then throwing four calories. Yeah, you should go to the grocery store. That's not the process. That's not the tradition. That is not the mechanism. You have to go through the study of figuring out what the taboos are for each Odu, and then we can match them with the legs. You know, for example, in EJ Ogbe, there's a taboo against wearing black because the uh, priests of Obatala who are, man, are incarnated in E.J. Okbe need to be uh, free from the uh, intrusion caused by the absorption of light. So every taboo has a purpose. So I'm asking, what would be the purpose of having five Ikan instead of four? Did anybody ever tell you that, the purpose? No. Five eyes. No, I mean, I'm not trying to slide from beating you up. But, you know, when when people talk about you got to do this, you got to do this, the question, the next question needs to be why? As our woes and the students of be far, we have the right to ask that question. We can't, even if you're told you can't ask that question because it's disrespectful. Nonsense. Ifa teaches 
that the issue of disrespect is irrelevant. We respect ourselves, and if somebody else doesn't respect us, that's their problem, not ours. So it's really, really uh, important as a way of preserving our faith to hold people accountable to the things they're telling us that don't make any sense. Sorry. Are we still friends? Uh, 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 Bob, I didn't mean to get so upset, but that's a, that's a uh, ongoing issue that we need to look at seriously as a community, I believe. You with me? I don't know, did, I, did I scare him away? I think I did. I'm Sorry. here, I say. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you understand the spirit that I'm coming from. You know, I've put a lot of time and effort in trying to be uh, consistent with the traditional teachings as I've been taught, certainly, and certainly not to engage in what I would call uh, cultural appropriation, you know? Ifa is what the people who created Ifa says it is. It's not what we'd like it to be. It's not like what we make it up to be. It's not what the, our friends tell us it is. According to UN Charter, indigenous uh, traditions have the right to define themselves. I don't know if you all noticed, but last weekend, the UN had a conference on the concept of Iwa Poile. How's that for a uh, nod in our direction? You know, so uh, these become important conceptual ideas but I see in Ifa that, that concerns me a lot is I see a heavy influence in Nigeria of Islam on Ifa and I see a heavy influence of Christianity on Ifa and the diaspora and that's fine but people should just call it what it is Ifa influenced by the prophet Muhammad Ifa influenced by the prophet Jesus you can do that freedom religion if you like it I love it but my preference is Ifa based on the prophet Romula and that's a very specific thing and it's very, uh, it's not completely documented, but it's well documented. And the notion that any part of the faith has been lost in Africa is total foolishness. They have preserved it to the point where little kids, 14 years old, can recite by heart the total opus of Odu, including the description of all the rituals we do, all the healing we do, all the metaphysics we believe in, all the farming techniques, all the combat techniques. Those things are all recited every year by children. How do you lose anything in that context? The answer is you don't. And uh, having blessed to hear, to hear that uh, recitation at least once in my life, uh, the restrictive taboos that I hear about a lot of diaspora, I just don't find uh, represented in the presentation of those verses in, in Yoruba culture as it exists in current day Nigeria. Was that too much information? Again, forgive me. Uh, Hassan, you had a question? Hassan? You have to dismute for me to hear the question. Right. Uh, he keeps trying. It's not when you figure it out, just interrupt. I'll know you're on. Sean, do you have a question? Sean and Travis? Oh, they're both. Good. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ready for your quiz for today? Oh, I'll show you. Nice. Sandy, you have a question? No, Sandy. I don't have any questions. Oh, who has a question? Sandy, Travis, do you have a question? I say, Baba. Yeah, okay. Uh, how about you, Sandy? Do you have a question? I say, Baba. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, look who's here. Sadie, do you have a question? Did you say you didn't? All right. For those who don't know, Sadie's uh, on the journey towards uh, joining this family. I'm impressed with her progress. Uh, where are we? Maria, here we come. This is where the deep questions come now. Does Oshun have any questions? No, I say about everything is good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So Jonathan, the answer is no, we don't. <laughs> We don't invoke a vision of creation through the use of mushrooms. Sorry. What, what's your next question? Wow. I wasn't actually <laughs> going to say that at all. I, listen, I'm messing with you. Uh, how, how is your studies of that coming? Are you still enrolled in the course? 
Um, yes and no. Uh, so I've actually had a friend of mine contact me from Ecuador and he wants to teach me ayahuasca ceremony and rites. So I'm here in Canada. Mushrooms are illegal, but ayahuasca uh, is completely legal. Really nice. Interesting. Yeah, I know. Right. So, but this is a little bit different than just doing the mushrooms because uh, there's actually a very strict uh, practice with it, like entire dietary freaking change. Uh, freaking. So it, it's a way that isn't just working with like these plant medicines, right? Like I've, I'm, in all honesty, I've gotten more visions from sitting with my cactus than ever ingesting it, right? <laughs> I like it, yes. Well, uh, listen, uh, in, in if, uh, that kind of medicine is called Togba. Togba, okay. I think that's how you pronounce it. So do you have a question? I'm sorry, I was being- Oh, no, it's all good, yeah. <laughs> I enjoy these a uh, little bit of some banter, right? Because it's adding clarity and making sure that we're not doing stupid stuff. But uh, going back to how does uh, things come from nothingness? I've been <laughs> wrapping my mind around that one for a while. So my best uh, understanding of it would probably be, so if darkness is power and light is knowledge, well, the, the combination between the two, you know, the something from nothing is understanding the two polarities to create that line of singularity of the two polarities in unison. That, that's how everything is created is from that, that nothingness to uh, creation. And then there's three stages even behind that from uh, my own meditations. But uh, that's a whole nother subject altogether. Listen, that's not a bad idea. We should definitely explore that on a future date. Uh, and I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you for uh, listening to my thoughts on the other side of things. Yeah, thank you for putting up with my snarkiness. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Baba. <laughs> I love you too. Uh, where are we at there? Eileen, did you have a question? Uh, maybe after I listen to this video like four or five times. What? Maybe after I listen to the video four or five times. All right. All right, all right. Uh, Oscar, did you have a question? Oh, Oscar, uh, can you mute your, uh, unless you have a question? Oscar, do you have a question? Uh, Oscar, do you have any questions? All right. Okay. Brenda, did you have a question or a comment? I hopped in too late. It's always uh, uh, between dinner time that you have. Oh, your... I see. Sorry. It's my dinner time. So I think, oh, I was forgetting it again. So I, I just I just got in. But uh, <laughs> is, is, where, where can I uh, well, where can I find It'll be, it, it'll be on the Egg Bay page and we're working on putting it on YouTube. That's all in process. I need to, to up my game with regarding the technology of all this, but we're, we're heading that direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was my question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, doctor, your question. Camilla. Abura Boye, Baba, Ia Pajalabi, all the elders in the group, Ikaro family. Um, Ashe Baba, I don't have any questions. Well, that's disturbing. I... <laughs> yeah, Fashe Go, do you have a question? No. Abura Boye, no question. Boye Bachiche, what's your question? Oh, sorry, no question. Oscar, do you have a question? Oscar, tene un pregunta? I guess not. Uh, Julia, you have a question? Julia? All right, so I know Dr. Oshun Lade has a question. What's your question, yeah? Hello, you're moving away. You know, I am just integrating and processing right now. This is so deep. I mean, I need that. Um, what did you say? The tape? <laughs> no, this is great. I don't have a question yet, but 
but I think when I sit with it and meditate on it more, something will probably come up. So. Well, that sounds like the PLAN. Don't hesitate before we leave if you got a question. Obatola, do you have a question? Um, Aburo Buye, um, Kenka Mashay, to all of the elders that are on the line. I, um, you know, was listening and I'm always fascinated with language as well. Um, the, the Odu is also the womb of the woman. And so what I'm trying to understand if Ifa recognizes that and, and, and recognizes the power of the mothers and the power of the, the women and the, it's like kind of a gender neutral, like the women have a role, the men have a role and you know, no one can really do anything without the other. Why is there so much patriarchy that has kind of invaded the whole process? And, you know, like, I, I don't, when does that start to really balance itself out? Because I, I, I don't, I'm not asking the question correctly, but I'm, I'm listening to it and in my head, I'm sounding real sharp, but the words coming out of my mouth are not, like I, I don't understand why, why the patriarchy has practically denigrated or destroyed the, 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 the ashe of the woman in Ifa. Well, yeah, let me look at it historically uh, when the missionaries, uh, Ian and I were talking about this yesterday. Uh, when the missionaries first came to Nigeria, the thing that they noticed that really, really upset them was there was no crime in Nigeria at all. So they studied the culture long enough to see that the enforcement of uh, moral codes belonged to the mothers of Iami and uh, the uh, Oro of Obomi. And the first thing they did in an effort to instill Christianity was to outlaw those two societies. To this day, they're illegal, Iami and uh, Ogboni, and demonized. That's an idea that was introduced to the culture from outside the culture. So the question you're asking is, why does human consciousness allow itself to be influenced by a perception of cosmology that denigrates other human beings? That's the question you're asking. That's the whole topic of what we're talking about today. So for me, we have the influence of the prophet Jesus and the influence of the prophet uh, Muhammad in stark contradiction to the influence of the prophet Arumila who preached gender equity and who said that uh, in order to co-create the world, men and women need to work together, join hands to do that. And he created a structure of ritual in which male, female working together is essential to absolutely everything we do without exception. So whenever you hear the word women can't do this, shouldn't do that, that is total uh, horse poo poo. It has no basis in traditional EFI at all. So the question then becomes, and that's why I was telling the, uh, uh, the Baba earlier, People tell you that nonsense, you ask them why. And I'm telling you to say, well, because my padrino said so, that's not an answer. That is an excuse. So in order to have an answer, you need to really engage in the theological di dialogue that justifies the implementation of rules that make no sense. So you have the issue of the constant restrictions on behavior as a manifestation of uh, controlling others, which is really the linchpin of Christianity, in my opinion. You know, Christian, well, you can't talk to a Christian about Ifa because they're Christians. Oh, okay, well, what does that mean and who cares? I should be able to talk about anything I want. So uh, if you have a religion in which even entertaining ideas for their culture uh, causes you offense, then, then what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what is it you're trying to communicate in that moment? You know, that only you know the truth. How does that make you got? And so if you're the only person with the truth, 
then you're justified in treating people in a derogatory way. Uh, Bobby, you're fading. You're kind of fading in you're and out. You're not God. I can only do it. Uh, I hope I'm not being censored. But in any case, uh, you, you faded out on me, Baba. Sorry. How about now? Okay, much better. Much better. I'm going to try and talk slower. I'm going to go off my rant. But, but those, those questions are the reasons why I hold these conversations. Uh, uh, you know, we need to sort that out. Here's the problem, in my humble opinion, historically. If you can imagine before the internet, if you can imagine before we were able to talk to each other on the planet, if you can imagine growing up under the conditions of enforced servitude, you know, during slavery, there were no theological schools that he thought that people could attend and compare notes, you know. So in the process of information, emancipation, you have a huge influence of Catholicism on cultural norms that were suppressed and not allowed to be explained. So you had years of generating confusion. But I, I think to the extent that we can stand up for religious freedom, for the extent to which we can research the origins of our ideas, we can begin to sort out those influences not because one's better than the other, but because we should have the right to choose. And the only way you can choose is with informed information. If you want to do IFA based on Christianity, if you like it, I love it. I have no interest in that subject at all. If you want to do IFA influenced by Islam, be my guest. I have no interest in that subject at all. But I'm interested in, and which I say clearly, and about which there should be little or no confusion, I'm interested in the ephah taught by the prophet Arumila as preserved in the oral scripture of Yoruba culture. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and not reflective of patriarchy or sex, except to the extent that it's been uh, appropriated by outside influence. That, you know, there's a big movement in Africa now to replace traditional IFA with in, I, Islam based IFA. Huge uh, war going on there over that issue. And the people who are promoting Islam as an uh, alternative to the Prophet of Rumula are also on the payroll of the oil companies doing things uh, to make sure the oil companies do not need to pay the uh, people of Nigeria, what they deserve in terms of the exploitation of their resources. You know, I've talked about that many times. And if you live in Alaska, you get a check for $10,000 a year from my oil companies as your share of the resources taken from your state. That same law applies to Nigeria and no Nigerian, as far as I know, has ever received a dime from the oil companies. The kings and the presidents and the generals receive money, but not the people. That's a gross violation of uh, international law, which is justified under the slogan Lord in heaven. Maybe even here. Let's change the topic. Maybe they'll let me speak. Am I being clear, more or less? I hope. Um, yes. And, you know, that, that was really powerful. I guess maybe because lately I'm hearing new ways of trying to silence women by saying, oh, you know, uh, you, too many women have masculine energy and they're, they're not feminine anymore. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand that. Um, and then there's this whole taboo against black women being angry, you know, or raising out, oh, you're being hysterical. And it's like, wait a minute, are you telling me I, I can't have a, a rational, I get pissed off because something happened and I can't express that particular emotion. So, you know, it, it, it's certain things that I begin to look at and I'm like, okay, how does this fit? Where does this fit? And um, why, what, what are the steps that are needed to be taken to kind of overcome this bullshit? Yeah, and right. I'm just put it out there just like that. And, you know, and, and I guess that's a conversation for another day. But these are, you know, thoughts of Obatola. What could I tell if, you? 
there's there's two there's two answers to that question. The first is to re uh, claim the process of critical thinking, which is all but dead in the West these days. Critical mm -hmm. thinking, also the ability to apply critical thinking to the script, script, scriptural sources that we claim are guiding our lives, which I see very little of Nefa of that effort. And then I would say thirdly, an effort to understand the real meaning, context, and value of unconditional love, which is what's taught by the Oba. So if you don't engage in those three things, we're just going to be stuck in a greed-based mentality in which uh, profit motive trumps kindness to others. Yeah. That's or, it. Or, yeah. <laughs> Ashe, trumps. Baba, Ashe. <laughs> I should have used no. a different uh, verb, but in any case, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gail, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, I say, Baba, I'm still vibing on the invocation of Bila. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's always good. Uh, Gina, did you have a question or a comment? Alafia, uh, Baba. Love and to all my elders, um, I'm grateful for this morning's lesson um, because we were studying this a year ago and now it, it all makes sense to understand the vernacular, to understand how we were put into trance um, and, and the evoking um, of Ela and how it had a positive effect on our lives in that moment and how it continues to venerate um, in our lives on a daily basis um, now makes so much sense. So another piece you put to, you put another piece of the puzzle um, in the puzzle and help it all make sense. And more Dubway, um, Baba, you know, I love you. And uh, more Dubway. I say, uh, <laughs> Robin, did you want to say something? Hello? Is that a no? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm not sure who that is. Someone's on the screen is yeah, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, Duny? All right, so. Oh, Hassan, did you want to say something? I say to all the elders. Bob, the question is, Aruna is one with the priest Melchizedek, um, Underneath the seal order of the green one. I'm sorry, I'm not. Me, Baba? I can't. Can you write your question? The green one. What about the green ones? The green one? I'll write it. I'll write it, Baba. Please uh, write it and I'll and I'll read it, I promise. I say, I say, I'll I'll contact you later. It's a deep question. So I... oh, if you okay, no problem, Baba. Put it in the chat if you would please. Orisha Bami Dada, did you have a question? All right. So James, do you have a question? And uh, yes, uh, I was just want to piggyback on the concept of black women not being able to be angry as a direct um, contradiction to what they teach in both Ifa and Orisha uh, practice because every form of natural, I'm not gonna say disaster or natural form of anger is um, personified by women. Um, we look at um, Oba Anya, we look at Oya, we look at 
um, the the river when it gets um, when it overflows. When we look at the other guys, so if, if all these natural energies are the location of the emotion of anger, why can't the actual manifestation of women be angry or the black woman be angry? It's it's, it's a form of control and it is not even supported by the thing that they're saying that it's supported by. So it's it's BS basically. Well I'm not sure I heard all that. Uh, uh. It's just, it sounds like you were supporting the taboo against women being angry. I hope I missed something. No, no, no. I, what I was supporting was what I was supporting was um, what I was saying is what is being said about the taboo of women being angry is not supported by Ifa. It's actually contradicting what Ifa. Oh, All right. Is yes. 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 Yeah, every. Yeah. You have a really, really bad connection, so I'm going to comment on that briefly. And then... Okay, I appreciate it, Baba. It's <laughs> all right. Listen, so uh, here's the point. We all get angry. The issue is how do you process it? Uh, Ifa does teach that getting angry at each other doesn't help much. Uh, so that we have support systems. You know, we have EME, we have men Society, where men can get together and vent, you know. I tell men that they should never raise their voice uh, against a woman because a woman will fear for their safety and not hear what they're saying. So men uh, can, can support each other by creating a safe place where men can vent and then go back and address the issue without anger. You know, anger simply tells us that there's a problem. The ability to recognize that and then step outside of our anger to resolve the problem is what Ifa teaches. Now that could be uh, conflated to mean women should get angry. That's not what I'm saying. We all get angry, we all have emotions, that's all natural. The issue is, what do you do with those emotions? And I would say the key thing is, and this is the hardest thing, you know, if you look at the first principle of uh, Iwa Pele, it's make no judgments. So you, the idea of blaming somebody for your anger mm, doesn't comport well with the idea of and it doesn't say people don't make us angry. The issue is taking responsibility for the anger. Uh, I have said repeatedly, and it's hard to hear, it's hard to do, it's hard to be, but racism, sexism, and homophobia are real issues. Ifa teaches that how we choose to uh, respond to those things is always our choice. And Ifa further says that if you respond to those those uh, phobias without anger, you have a better chance of resolving the problem. Uh, and so that's, you know, the question is, do you want to be angry and make enemies or do you want to be objective and solve the problem? That's, that's the choice. That's the choice in every moment of any, every interaction we have. And, you know, I, and having said that, I mean, I get it. If you tell anybody, a man or a woman, they can't be angry, that's a guarantee it'll never happen. So the, uh, the issue is uh, understanding the function of anger. You know, there's a difference between disappointment, sadness, uh, and grief and anger. Sometimes those four emotions get uh, conflated with one another. Uh, and frequently, and here's the key point, Ifa teaches that anger is uh, a message from God pointing out an unresolved conflict in your own ori. It, 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 until we can really take that idea seriously, which is really a hard idea to come to terms with, then I think anger controls us instead of us uh, controlling our anger. Uh, uh, does that make sense? I hope. Who we got left here? Monique, do you have a question? Monique? All right, uh, I think the last call for questions here. Hassan, okay, did you put your question in the chat room? Let me look real quick. I don't see one either. Hello, let me look. That's, okay, what are we gonna do? Okay, what is it? Can you read it to me? Yeah, it is, it is the prophet Ramallah and the prophet Melzegat. 
Okay. okay. Yes, okay. So the question was, is the prophet Arumli and the prophet uh, Meldesiak one and the same? The uh, Ojo Arumli in Lagos, which is kind of a contemporary version of Ifa, claims that they are one and the same. I think the more traditional Ifa version would be that um, prophets that are connected to source emerge at different times in history in different places on the planet with the same message. I mean, if you really look at it, uh, that was a Greek idea. The idea of Christos predates Jesus by at least a thousand years. So that the historical Jesus claimed to be the Christos by virtue of uh, preparation, initiation, and connection to spirit. And so we have the same process with Ifa initiation where you claim to be connected to the spirit of Arumila, but I think ultimately the proof is in the pudding. The word Arumila means uh, heaven is my light. And even within Ifa, there are references to at least two people who had the title of Arumila, meaning they ascended their consciousness to a place where they could uh, deliver prophetic messages. And the, and the mm, the only way to really validate that is to examine the influence a particular prophetic message has on a particular culture in a particular time in history. You know, I would argue no matter what the value of uh, the spoken messages of the prophet Jesus were, for example, the influence on history at times has been less than noble. So those are uh, questions that... Uh, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. To say that the Romulan and Melchizedek deck the same, I'm not sure that I can say that one way or the other. I can say that they connected to a similar source of consciousness. And it was very similar because Melchizedek was the priestly voice of the dragon initiations uh, of the pharaonic lineage that gave birth to the historical Jesus, which was suppressed historically by the biblical Jesus. So there's a conflict even uh, within the lineage of Melchizedek over who, what, where his message has been received and uh, uh, accurately spread. I don't know if that answered the question, hopefully. Uh, from uh, Brenda, the Jesus and Mary, definitely the historical Jesus had children. That's provable. Uh, it's also provable that everything quoted, attributed to Jesus in the Bible can be found in uh, Essene texts that are written a couple hundred years before the historical Jesus supposedly lived. So there's a lot of controversy around all those issues. Anger shows us what needs to be changed and what boundaries have been crossed. That's from... Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, James says, one day I pray that someone explains human design to me. It's so interesting, yet I don't understand it. Yeah, well, human design, I think we can understand from an Ifa perspective based on understanding the relationship between Ori and Odu. Odu uh, gives us the ability to see a problem with resolution in the same instant, which is a map maximum use of consciousness as a tool of um, critical thinking. <laughs> Did everybody hear Ian on that? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm muted. Uh, uh, Ian says that I talk about human nature every time I speak. I would think, I would like to think so. You know, human consciousness is rooted in archetypes. Archetypes are Odu. The vision of Odu that creates consciousness comes to us when we're in possession with Ela. And the more that we're able to visualize the uh, Ashe of Ela in our meditative state, the more we can see, actualize, make use of, and uh, project onto the world our essential nature, which the prophet Rumla teaches is to be a good and blessed person, otherwise known as exhibiting Iwa Pele. Listen, we've gone a little over today. Is everybody good? Uh, uh, any further questions? Listen, if you have a question, put up the emoji. Uh, and otherwise, Jamar, did you have a question? Yeah, I did, Baba. Uh, a real quick question, right? So um, I, I remember in quantum physics, they talked about the theory of uh, antimatter being right. the connected tissue between uh, all matter in the universe. 
Right. What would the uh, the Yoruba perspective be for antimatter? Yeah, antimatter would be the quantum entanglement caused by the uh, Irunale, it's called. Irunale from the Elysian, Irun, Imo, Ole, meaning the, the beard of the house of light, meaning the string that connects all things. So antimatter, I think is a bad choice of words. Antimatter, I would say, is closer to the un- the unmodified blueprint of creation, which becomes opposed to the manifestation because they're not the same thing. If they were the same thing, everything would be perfect. We'd all love each other. God would be on earth. Love would be everywhere. So antimatter would be the ability to choose that which is not our essential nature. And that becomes possible at every level of creation from an atom up to uh, a sun. You know, the... uh, there was an astonishing fact I read uh, that was posted by Dr. Farrell, one of my inspirations. Dr. Farrell said that in 1998, for two days, the sun stopped projecting solar flares. If we lived in a me- mechanistic universe, that would not be possible. If that, in fact, happened, it would happen permanently if you understand astrophysics. The fact that it happened at all tells me and uh, the good doctor, that the sun made a choice to shut itself down. Mm-hmm. And so if you think about that for more than a minute, you'll realize there might be some truth to astrology. Make sense, I hope. Uh, Make complete sense. F. Ontario, do you have a question? Uh, yes, Bob, a real quick question. From the cosmological point of view, what does the erosion represent? Yeah, erosion from the Elysian E, uh, erosion. Uh, e, ro, osun means, uh, it literally means the descent of uh, menstrual blood, uh, uh, not menstrual blood, also the, dis- the descent of female uh, procreation, uh, ashe. So erosun is a synonym for uh, menstrual blood, although it has deeper implications. Uh, erosion, which is different than erosion, you understand? Those are similar sounding words. Erosun is the red uh, camwood powder. Uh, erosun is the yellow, uh, the yellow. Uh, Hold on one second. Powder. Erosun. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, term, right. Term, right. Yeah. But if you look at the linguistics, I have to take a closer look, but it sounds like erosun and erosun. Erosun is a reference to the to the to the ashe of the mothers. Erosun is erosun. Erosun is a reference to the ashe of giving birth. So in the birth process, erosun, you wouldn't be a mother until the process is completed. Sort of, you understand? So erosion tends to be a reference to, uh, erosion is a reference to the birth of creation. Erosion is a reference to the birth of a particular lineage in the process of evolution. Okay, I'm gonna sit with that, Baba Ashe. Uh, Linguistically, that's the best I can do. Is it the last word? Probably not. If you can come up with better stuff, play with the illusions and look them up in the, your dictionary and see what you come up with. Okay, will do. Ashe. HD explains Eva so nicely. What's HD? What? Brenda, what's HD? Human design, Baba. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Very well spoken. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so last call, last call. Are we good? Are we good? What? What? Do I see any more hands up? I don't see any more hands up. Thank God uh, Jonathan and I are still friends. Uh, and Fadara, I think he We're family, are. Baba. <laughs> exactly. Hello. Maria looks very contemplative. Uh, Ia needs to call you sometime soon. Uh, okay, so I'm going to call that a day. Uh, everybody stay safe. Know that you're loved and appreciated. Uh, We'll continue this conversation next week, all right?
because uh, we've just scratched the surface. This is like stage one. So hopefully people will have a little better understanding of the language we're using so that they can internalize it in a way that allows them to externalize. You know, ifa is the word for wisdom. Ife is, is the word for love. So ife in, ife out. We internalize ife so that we can project it into the world in the form of ifa. That's the dynamic that we're talking about. Same thing with female power. Gay is, uh, ga is female power that we internalize. Gay is female power that we externalize. So did Dr. Oshun Lade have one last question here before we call it a day? Yeah. Yes, thank you. It is really quick. I just want to make sure I have the spelling right. So Irosun, I-R-O-S-U-N. That's the red powder you were talking about? Yes. Okay. And then how do you spell the, is it just the accents? No, erosion is y i y e r s o s u n i y e r s u n erosion to okay, make the you. subject to make the subject extremely confusing. In some dialects, erosion is pronounced erosion, and erosion is pronounced osun. So you have to look at the context to make sure you're understanding what's being said. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Mariama looks skeptical. You with me? Uh, yeah, all go. Oh, there we go. That's uh, good. Uh, it's, we're gonna call it a day, everybody. Uh, stay safe and uh, we'll talk again. Uh, uh Odabo, 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 thank, thank you, you so much. much. You have a good week. Everybody. Mm -hmm.